from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18. And this is one of the most dramatic stories in all the Bible. 1821. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered, not a word. Elijah is the most remarkable character to me in all the Old Testament. I like to read about him. He's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament, and when Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two men that were there with him, Elijah and Moses. So we know that hundreds of years after Elijah had died or had been taken to heaven, we know that he came back. And we know that he was living and he was talking because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here in his life story, he suddenly appears at the darkest moment of Israel's history. Never had the nation gone so low morally, spiritually, militarily, economically, as it was at this hour. The nation was struggling for its very existence, and out of nowhere there came this rugged, strong, craggy, young, long-haired, sun-tanned son of the desert, Elijah. And he suddenly announced to the people, Elijah is here. And the king trembled on his throne because Elijah came in the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. It used to be said that Mary, Queen of Scots, was more afraid of the prayers of John Knox, one preacher, than she was all the armies of England. One man and God constitute a majority anywhere. Elijah was a mighty prophet of the Lord. And what had happened in Israel that had caused Israel to go down so rapidly was that a very wicked man had come to the throne. His name was Ahab. And the Bible says that he did more evil than any other king that had ever preceded him. And then he did something else. He married a woman from one of the heathen nations, which was against ancient Israeli law. He married Jezebel. And she worshipped Baal. She didn't believe in God. She didn't believe in the God of ancient Israel. She didn't believe in the God of Moses. She didn't believe in the God of Abraham. She believed in Baal. And Baal was one of the worst forms of worship that we've ever known. Filled with sensuality, sex orgies, human sacrifice, and all the rest. And this is a very interesting thing. That in a time when people turn away from the true God, many times you'll find that they will put sex, violence, and their religion together. And we're seeing indications of that in America with the rise of Satan worship and their cults, the emphasis on sex, the emphasis on violence, Put them together and you have something the Bible says that God abhors and God will judge and the wrath of God will fall upon that people. And that was the situation when Elijah appeared on the scene. And the first thing Elijah did was to protest. Except Elijah was almost alone. He thought he was alone. But God had told him later that there were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And Elijah said to the king, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather all the prophets of Baal that believe in idolatry and lead idolatry in this country. I want you to gather them at Mount Carmel that looks out over the Mediterranean Sea. And I'll come up there and we'll let all the people come and watch and we'll have a contest. I will debate 
the 450 prophets of Baal publicly and let the people decide who is God. And the king said, all right. So all the people gathered, thousands of people gathered on Mount Carmel and the 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah was standing for God alone. He was just one man, one solitary prophet standing there all by himself. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get two bulls, build two altars. You call on your God, Baal. I'll call on my God, the true and the living God, and we'll see who answers by fire. They said, all right. So they built their altar. They cut their bull, bullock up, laid it on the altar, thousands of people watching, and then they began to call on Baal. They said, oh, Baal, 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 answer by fire. We know you're the true God. Nothing happened. And Elijah stood there and laughed at it. And it's one of the most humorous things in all the Bible. He said, go ahead, yell. Maybe your God's on a trip somewhere. <laughs> and from morning till noon, they screamed and they yelled and they cried and they prayed and then they began to cut themselves until blood was gushing out all over the place, trying to get Baal to answer. But of course, Baal couldn't answer. Then Elijah said, all right, it's time for me to take over. He said, all right, build the altar. And they built the altar, put the bullock on the altar. He said, now I want you to get 12 barrels of water and pour it on top. Dig a trench around it, fill that with water, and everything is soaking wet. Then Elijah called upon God. And the fire came down from heaven and burned up the bullock and burned up the altar, burned up the whole thing. And the people said, we believe in the Lord God who is answered by fire. And Elijah won the day and left Mount Carmel victorious over the false prophets of Baal. I want you to notice who was there. Three groups of people. One group one man, Elijah. So on the other side, 450 prophets of Baal, all experts in religion, philosophy, and psychology. And, on the, and out in between were the vast mass of people who were not sure. They were uncommitted. They were not sure whether Baal was God. They were not sure whether Elijah's God was God. Their ancient, ancient traditions made them want to believe in Jehovah. Their interest, though, was in pleasing the king and being relevant and being in. They didn't want to be old-fashioned and traditionalist and out of step. They didn't want to be caught believing in the Ten Commandments if that wasn't the end thing. You see, men have always been sort of faddist. We go after fads. That's true in every generation. And the end thing at that moment was to believe in Baal with all the freedom of sex and sensuality and the orgies. Now, they didn't like the human sacrifice, but all religion demands some sort of sacrifice. So what they would do, they'd take their babies, many times a chosen baby, and put in the hands of this great God and the baby would be burned up and they'd give their babies as human sacrifices. That was Baal worship. But then there were many who were secret followers of the true God. They didn't believe all that hocus pocus about Baal. They had a guilty feeling about it, but they were afraid. They were afraid of standing up for God, afraid of standing up for what they believed to be truth. And so they didn't take a stand publicly. You see, Jesus demands a public stand. That's why I ask people to come forward. He demands a public stand. You can't be a secret follower of Jesus and please him. 
He said, if you're not willing to take your stand publicly and openly, I'll not take my stand openly for you in heaven. And without the intercession of Jesus Christ, none of us would ever make it. And then Elijah said something to all these people. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if fail, then follow him. He said, make a decision. God's not going to allow you to have an altar to bail in your home, to materialism in your home, and then go to church on Sunday and think that's going to do it. You've got to come all out for Jesus Christ. He must be first and Lord in every area of your life if you're to be acceptable to God. Now, the people had seen the evidence. They knew Baal couldn't give them peace and joy and happiness. They knew that. You know, one of our most famous film stars said the other day this. I won't call her name, but she was quoted in one of the magazines as saying this. I was the victim of the American dream. I'd been brought up to believe that when I found success, I would automatically be terribly happy. We were all taught that. Well, I got the success. I'd spent 21 years believing that as soon as all these wonderful things happened to me, my troubles would vanish. Well, they didn't. It, it was a big disillusionment, she said. And she's only 21 now. 21 years! Thinking that if she made it on television, and she's famous on television, and she's famous in motion pictures around the world, that she'd be happy. She said, it's been a big disillusion. You see, Baal can't bring inner peace and satisfaction to the human heart. Pascal once said it, the great scientist. He said, happiness is neither within or without us. It is in God. And only when God is in us is happiness within us and without us. How true that is. Happiness and peace and joy come in knowing God. Baal couldn't answer their deepest needs, their great philosophical questions of where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going. Baal gave them no answers. Neither does capitalism and materialism and secularism and humanism. It's found only in a relationship with God. You see, you were made for God made in God's image, made for fellowship with God. And you can try all your life in a thousand different directions to find that certain something and you'll never find it. I've seen men strive to become the most brilliant scientist, and I know some of the most brilliant scientists in America, that are miserable. I've seen men spend their lifetime making money, and I know some of the richest men in America, and I know how miserable some of them are. I've seen men strive all their lives to attain political power. And they get political power. They get the office they were seeking, but it doesn't bring the peace and the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment they thought it would. But here's an interesting thing. I've never seen a person give their lives to Jesus Christ sincerely, but what they didn't find, what they were looking for. He satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts and our lives. Now, Elijah taught us one thing, and Jesus teaches it too. You must make a choice. You have a will of your own, and you have to decide. How long will you halt between two opinions? Jesus said there are two ways of life. Now, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some of you think you're all right and that you're on the right road now. You don't realize that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Jesus said there are two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. The narrow road leads to eternal life. The broad road leads to destruction. And every person in this audience tonight is on one or the other. Which are you on? He said there are two masters. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and hate the other. He said make a choice. He said there are two fathers. You know, the Bible doesn't teach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, not in the sense that many people teach it. By creation, he's our father. By creation, we're all members of the same human race. 
And that's why we're to love each other no matter what race we come from. We're all brothers in that sense. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we are not all of the same father and all of the same blood. There are only two groups those who are lost and those who are saved, those on the broad road, those on the narrow road. You must be on one or the other. And there are two destinies. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I know it's not popular today to believe in hell. You can believe in heaven, but people would rather not think about hell. I don't blame you. It's a terrible place. But the Bible teaches it's going to be a hell there is a hell where men are going to be separated from God forever and there's a heaven where men are going to fellowship with each other and fellowship with Christ forever you must make a choice you young people you have to make the choice this is one choice you can't depend on your parents to make for you your parents can teach you and help you and do their best. And many of you parents have done your best with your children. You've prayed for them, you've loved them. But there comes a time when they have to make their own choice about Jesus Christ. They have to decide for themselves in the lonely arena of their own hearts. The greatest battle that's ever fought is this battle in the heart of a young person about Jesus Christ. And this is one thing you can't depend on anybody to make for you. You have the ability to make it. You have the right to make it. You can say yes or you can say no. It's one or the other. And Jesus does not allow neutral ground. And he warns against waiting too long. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come while you can. Don't put it off any longer. How long halt you between two opinions? Now, when you make that choice, there's going to be a price to be paid. The people that choose Jesus Christ will pay a price. There are thousands of people in other parts of the world. The price they have to pay is they're ostracized from their family. In some parts of the world, they can never go any further than grammar school if they make a decision for Christ. They can never get a job above menial labor if they make a decision for Christ. But in those parts of the world, thousands upon thousands are living for Jesus Christ. In America, we've had sort of an unnatural situation. It's almost popular to follow Christ in some areas of the country now. That won't last long. There's always a price. And if you receive Christ as your Savior and try to live for him, some people are going to sneer and they're going to make fun behind your back. And in this period of conformity, we don't want to be considered too different. But he calls upon you to be different. When the gang is doing certain things you know to be wrong, you take your stand and say, no, I can't do that because I'm a Christian. Because I believe in Jesus Christ. It costs something to follow Christ. And Jesus said, you better sit down and count the cost one day. You see, a big crowd was following Jesus and he said, wait a minute, count the cost. Do you know that I'm going to die on a cross and if you follow me, you're going to have to go die with me? Oh, we didn't know that, Jesus. We thought you were setting up a big kingdom. We were going to be in the kingdom with you. So they left him. They will, there will be the cross for you to bear before the crown. And when you do come to Jesus Christ, you're going to be tested by God. God never has anyone come to him that he doesn't test you. Some of you have made your decisions for Christ this week, and already you're being tested. Temptation is coming. A friend doesn't understand the step that you've taken. Already you're filled with some doubts and weakness. This is all normal to every person that ever came to Christ. We don't start, just jump right out and be full grown. 
Grady Wilson, just his daughter just had twins. Well, they weren't born full grown. One of them was five pounds and one was six pounds. And they're just little tiny babies. But they will be full grown someday. But it takes time to grow. God will test you when you come to Christ. And he demands an immediate decision. I wonder how many more sermons it would take to win you to Christ. How many more warnings will God have to give you? How, how many more graves will have to be dug? How many more wars will have to be fought? How many more earthquakes or tornadoes and floods will have to come before you make your decision? The thief on the cross took that one moment and said, Lord, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That quick, you can make your decision and commitment. And remember, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. You're sinful. You're separated from God by sin. And some of the results of this sin are worry and irritability and lack of purpose in life, as well as some of the gross, immoral sins that we read about. God has provided the cross as a means for you to be forgiven of sin. But you must individually receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You and you alone in the quiet arena of your heart will have to make that decision. How long will you halt between two opinions? Charlotte Elliott was a beautiful woman. And a great preacher by the name of Caesar Milan went all over Switzerland. He was put out of his church because of his faith. But once he was in England and he met this beautiful, charming young woman by the name of Charlotte Elliott. She was suffering ill health. And he went up to her and asked her if she would become a Christian. And she rebuked him and said, I resent you asking me that. And she was very irritated at him. He said, I didn't mean to be offensive to you, but I only meant to tell you that God loves you and God's willing to change your life and give you peace in your heart. That night, Charlotte Elliott could not sleep. The words that the preacher spoke to her kept ringing in her ears. And during the night, she got up, got on her knees, gave her life to Christ, and she sat down and wrote the hymn that we sing every night. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as you are. You don't have to go home and change clothes. You don't have to go home and get better. You can't improve yourself. You come just like you are with all your sins, with all your failures, with all your mistakes, with all your hypocrisy. You come just as you are. He will forgive you and change you and come into your life. And I'm going to ask you to do just that publicly and openly right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. You may be a member of the church, you might have thought that you were right with God before, but somehow you know you're not. You're not sure. You're not certain, but you'd like to be. I'm going to ask you to come right now. From up in the top galleries, it'll take a minute or two to come, but we're going to wait. Hundreds of people have come every night. You come. This is your moment and your hour of commitment. And after you've all come and stand here... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight I want to read a passage of scripture that was on the cake that they presented to my oldest grandson the day that he was confirmed. And this was on the cake. It was third epistle of John, the fourth verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Of course, John was talking about those young converts of his that he called his children but here we could apply it to our families and to our own children you know the other night a 20 year old couple got married on friday night in ohio they came to toronto on their honeymoon 
attended the crusade Tuesday night and responded to the invitation to receive Jesus Christ. And the counselor said the husband immediately started taking his role as the spiritual leader of the home because he said, we're going to get into the word of God. And the counselor added, what a wedding present that was. There was a man here the other night who is one of the chief karate instructors in South Africa on his way home to Johannesburg. And after taking some refresher classes in Japan, he stopped here for two days. He attended the crusade, accepted Christ as his savior. 41 years old, he said, I'm rushing back to Johannesburg to tell my wife and family that I have found Jesus Christ. And we've had story after story. And if I'd had time tonight, I was going to tell you some more stories of people that have found Christ here in this tremendous crusade here in Toronto during these days. But I want to get quickly to what makes up a happy home or how you can have an, a, the right kind of a home. And the first point that I would like to make is that God performed the first marriage in the Garden of Eden. And it was God's idea to have a family in the first place. Before the cities and governments, written language, before nations, temples, churches, there were families. And the family is the most important institution in the world. The first miracle that Jesus ever performed was at a wedding at Cana of Galilee. And Jesus was underscoring the importance of the home. Because if the home goes, the nation is going to go. It was my privilege the other day to talk to the Prime Minister of this country and today to the Premier of Ontario. And in, on both occasions, it was interesting how we got to this idea of how the home is a basic unit and the home cannot be separated from the health of the nation or of the province. Many today are wringing their hands with fear and insecurity. But more important than what happens at Wall Street or what happens at the United Nations is what is happening to our families. In the home, character is formed. Integrity is born. Values we live by are made clear. Goals are set. Attitudes are formed that last a lifetime. Is your home built on a solid foundation? That's the question I want to ask. Remember the man Jesus told about that built his house on a rock? Is your house built on a rock? Is your home secure tonight? Or is it filled with tension? Is it about ready to break up? We've had more couples come forward here that were living together without marriage or more couples come forward here that have been separated and more couples that have been divorced that have come here together and be reunited than almost any crusade we've held in a long time. And it indicates to me that this is a growing problem in Toronto and it's a growing problem in this part of Canada as well as in the United States and other parts of the world. The third point I'd like to make is that our modern life puts tremendous pressures on the home and the family. You know some of the pressures that the home faces today. It reminds me of Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, where the scripture says there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build a wall. And we see rubbish everywhere. Rubbish on television and in films and in magazines. Making fun of the home, making fun of marriage. Making light of one of the holiest of all institutions, the marriage. And God has indicated from one end of the word to the other that when the home fails, the society is going to fail. And I tell you this, Unless we have a spiritual revival and our homes are renewed, the nation is going to be destroyed. There's no way that we can escape the judgment of God unless we come back to Christian or to God-fearing homes. You know, we're living in cities today. All over the world, people are moving to cities. As a boy on the farm, I could watch my father work and was made part of that work. Today, a man goes to work in a factory on office and his wife goes off to work too. And often the children never see either one of them doing their jobs. 
and they never become a part of it. In small rural communities of yesterday, everyone knew everyone. Teachers and parents were friends. But the working mother or the two Korea family is already upon us. And many times it's impossible to escape it because of taxes and because of inflation and all the rest of it. In order to make a living, both parents have to work in many instances. But Ezekiel 16 says, as is the mother, so is her daughter. As is the mother, so is her daughter. Which indicates that we as parents are to set the example in front of our children of Bible reading, of prayer, of integrity, of truthfulness, of honesty, and let them see in us Jesus Christ. Because one could say, as the father, so the son, as well as the mother and her daughter. And we have that responsibility as Christians. But we're glorifying today not getting married. I read the other day that 1,500,000 couples are living together in the United States without any intention of ever getting married. And the number of those getting married is decreasing and the number of divorces is mounting until one of our so great sociologists said recently at Columbia University that we may not have any homes at all by the end of this century. It may be something of the past. And sex is now treated by many like a physical appetite to be satisfied completely apart from any meaningful relationship. Just like you go out and buy a hamburger to satisfy your appetite. So you go out and have sex. That's not what God meant it to be at all. It's a holy gift from God to be used within matrimony. But there's a satanic attack on the family today. Even Christian families are feeling it. I've never heard so many stories of Christian families even having so much tension and so much difficulty. We've never had more books on the bookshelves telling us how to solve our family problems or sexual problems than we have today. And yet somehow we're more miserable, we're more broken, we're more torn, we're more hurt than we've ever been. Why? Because we have not taken the Word of God into account because God has laid down the rules and the regulations for a successful and happy home. And we've broken them. We thought we could do it some other way and we found that we failed. Let's come back to the Bible. Let's come back to the Word of God and build our homes on this book and the God that performed the first marriage. The fourth point I would like to make is that the family is still the most durable institution in the world. Historically, the family has survived all attacks. But many today want love without commitment. The latest polls indicate that young people may be turning back toward the family relationships and commitments, and it's most encouraging. Perhaps the tide is beginning to turn. I pray that it will be. I believe it is beginning to turn in the United States. And I'm happy to see it because, you see, even in Russia and China where they profess atheism, they're finding they cannot build a strong society without a home. They experimented at first without homes. They laughed at marriage, but now they've changed their minds. And then the fifth thing I'd like to say is the family needs help and encouragement. God is interested in your family, your marriage, your children. He shows us the ideals and the goals for the family, and he's willing to help us. Ezra said, then I proclaimed a fast there to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones. Seeking God's will for your family. That's what Ezra was doing. Seeking the will of God for his family. Have you sought God's will? Have you gotten on your knees and committed your children to the Lord time after time? Do you gather them together for family devotions? Or are you too embarrassed to are too hypocritical to. What keeps you from doing it? 
because it's been proven statistically that the homes that have Bible reading and prayer and go to church every Sunday, there's only one divorce in 400 marriages. While the national average in the United States is now almost one out of every two marriages. The answer is God. The answer is spiritual. The answer is surrendering your heart and your life to Jesus Christ as parents, as children, so that every member of the home knows Jesus Christ and loves the Word of God. And then the next point I would like to make is that the husband-wife relationship is the key to the family's success. Nearly all the psychologists or sociologists that I've talked to and books that I've read indicate that the home will only rise so high as the husband-wife relationship. The children seeing love between the husband and the wife. You see, many people get married without any idea of how much is at stake. And laying the foundation for failure in the very beginning, in courtship. You be careful who you go with and fall in love with. Be sure that he or she is God-fearing and loves Christ. The scripture says, be not unequally yoked together. How many of you have tried it and failed? There must be a spiritual oneness. There are three people that make up a marriage. The husband, the wife, and God. And be sure God is in your marriage. You see, so many are marrying someone with whom they have a very little chance of having a successful marriage. Seventeen magazine made a survey some time ago of young men and they asked the young men many questions and one of the questions was, what do you want your girlfriend to have on the first date? And the number one answer was a good figure. I would say the number one answer as far as I'm concerned would be to love the Lord with all her heart and all her mind. Many marry without being aware of the ideals and the goals which God has set for marriage. You see, God planned marriage for people with some maturity. Now, you can be mature when you're 17. You can be mature when you're 18, and you can be absolutely immature at 40. I see some little teenage 40-year-olds trotting around. And there are many of them. The scripture says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. You must be people who are ready to emotionally leave home. Now you think about that. We're always to love our parents. I don't care where you go to the ends of the earth. You're to love your parents. You're to confer with your parents. You're to honor your parents. You're to enjoy your parents. But when you get married, you must realize that they can never, that you can never again depend on them as you did when you were little children. Many parents ruin the marriage of their children by refusing to turn them loose. Learn when to turn them loose. For this cause shall a man leave, and his wife must be first, the husband must be first, while still honoring and loving and seeking the advice and the counsel of the parents. And the parents must learn how to turn loose. And when you turn them loose, I'm going to tell you something. When you turn them loose, they'll come back to you closer than ever as adults. And you'll enjoy them as much as you ever did. And then God wants marriages to be permanent until death do us part. Many people enter the marriage vow without any idea that this is for keeps. A young man at the marriage altar thinking to himself, if this doesn't work out, I'll get a divorce. Yes, tensions are going to come. There's going to be that adjustment period. And you keep adjusting the rest of your life. There'll be problems. 
there'll be disagreements. But you're to accept each other's faults. Your wife is not perfect and your husband is not perfect. You found that out after about two days. That first morning you saw her in curlers. And that first morning when she saw, saw you get up bleary eyed. And it's not always romantic. But we are to be together in a relationship that God has formed. We become one flesh. And many people that have been married for many years have loved each other so much and been together so much and know each other so well that they begin to look like each other. That's actually true. People tell me that I look like Ruth. If that's true, I'm getting mighty good looking. And I'll tell you, when I haven't seen her in two weeks, she looks better than ever. But there must be a lifetime commitment when you come to Christ. It's forever. Repeat it to yourself, forever, 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 till death do us part. Don't ever entertain the idea of separation and divorce. If you know Christ, He can hold you together. There is no problem that you face that cannot be solved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God's ideal is for the husband and the wife to be faithful to each other. Faithful to each other. I read the other day that 70% in a survey, 70% of the men's it indicated were cheating on their wives. I just can't believe that statistic. I, I cannot allow myself to believe it. It didn't say how many wives cheated on their husbands. But I want to tell you the Bible calls it adultery. And the Bible says that no adulterer will be in heaven. We don't realize what a vile and terrible thing it is to break the marriage vow with that type of a sin. I know it's old fashioned. I know that's out of date. But that's the teaching of the Word of God and the Word of God never, 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 never changes. It's the same. God hasn't changed in all these centuries. Do you think that God is changing His whole nature to accommodate Himself to your sins? No. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the same God that hated the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, hate the sins that we're committing today in the countries of the world that I travel in because it's worldwide. To have an affair is said to put uh, spice in a marriage. I read that the other day in some newspaper. It's a sin against God and it breaks the marriage vow. And many of you are asking, well, what can I do to help my marriage? The first step is to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Let him come into your life. You say, well, how do I do that? We've seen hundreds and even thousands here in Toronto come to Christ. Be willing to repent of your sins. That's the first step. Realize that God loves you. In spite of your sins, in spite of your failure, He loves you and He's willing to forgive you, but you must be willing to repent. And that word repent means to change. Change your mind. Change the direction of your life and determine that you're going to bring your life under the Lordship of Christ. If you failed in the home, if you failed at being a parent, if you failed at being a husband or a wife or an obedient child in the home, Surrender your life to Christ tonight and let him come into your heart and help you to be the right kind of a husband or wife or the right kind of a child. We had a man come forward in Las Vegas to make his commitment to Christ and he and his wife were in the divorce courts. And he called her on the phone and he said, I'd like to come and see you said, I'd like to settle this divorce business. And she didn't know what he meant. 
And so they got together and they went to the little restaurant where they'd been before. And they fell in love all over again. They called their lawyers and said, call it off. We're being reunited in Christ. That can happen to you. Maybe you and your wife haven't separated, but spiritually you're separated. Emotionally you may be separated. Psychologically separated. Let Christ come in and bring you together. And then our children need help. Our children need help. They need your love. You know, I heard a psychiatrist say many years ago that helped me. They said, you know, your children may come to a point where they do rebel because most children come to a point where they're seeking their own identity and, and they may rebel for three or four years or five years, a little bit. Maybe some of them wildly rebel. This psychiatrist said, let them know that you disapprove, but that you love them. And when they come through that point of rebellion, and when they find their own identity, the love will still be there. Let the love of Christ dominate your family, dominate your relationships within the family, and you can have a wonderful home. It's not too late to repair it. It's not too late to change. You can start tonight. What do you have to do? Be willing to repent of your sin and receive Christ by faith into your heart. Notice I said by faith. You may not understand it all. You may not understand what I mean when I say accept Christ by faith. You don't have to understand it all. Come by simple childlike faith like a...